Yes, DCGD14. I guess you don't know what that means. That's Coast Guard District That's 14. We have three representatives of it here. Uh, we have Jim Morrow, we have Nick Wurst, and we have Jeff Bryant. They're all commanders. So if you don't mind, you people out there watching the show, if you would, if you would just stand at attention through the next half hour, uh, we'd all be in balance that way. Welcome to the show, Jim, Nick, and Jeff. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having us. Pleasure to be here. So this is the military in Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, it's Think Tech, and we <clears> like <throat> doing this a lot because we, we get to see and understand the connect the dots on the military in Hawaii, which is a very important element in our society. And the Coast Guard is very important to me and you know personally because I was in the Coast Guard for a, a sort of extended reserve period through the Vietnam War. And I want to tell you guys a short story, and then we begin seriously, okay? So I get to Honolulu. Our office was at 1347 Kapiolani. The Admiral Two Star um, was, uh, was, he was a great guy, and um, I had not met him. I had not seen an Admiral in my life, any Admiral anywhere, but I still had to go to the head. So I went to the head, being untrained in, in, in the matter, and uh, there were two urinals in, in the head. And uh, it was indoors, of course, and he was at the right one, I was at the left one. And I said I was really, you know, intimidated by his rank. Um, I said, good afternoon, Admiral, and I, and I was at the head, and I, and I raised my, my arm to salute, and I saluted him, okay, which is ridiculous, because in the Naval Service, <laughs> right, you don't salute indoors, ever. But much less, you don't salute at the urinal. And, you know, it doesn't matter what the difference in rank is. You just don't do that. And, and by the way, you've got other things that you've got to take care of while you're there. Yeah. So I saluted him. I said, uh, Fabic was his name, Ted Fabic, great guy. And um, I saluted him. I said, good afternoon, Admiral. And the guy, the guy was so cool. He turned to me, you know, and he saluted me back. <laughs> good, good afternoon, Lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved him from that moment forward. He was such a good guy. But that, you know, that is, a, it's about people. The Coast Guard is about people. I really never met anybody I didn't like in my time. I was there six years, and uh, he was just one of the guys I loved. So um, let, me, let me ask you a story question, you guys. Um, what, what is the, the difference between the Coast Guard and the Navy now? It, was, it wasn't so different in 1944. Um, but it's different now. What's the difference, Jim? I think the difference now that, that you saw back in the day as we shifted, uh, you know, how the, the whole service kind of shifted from September 11th. The events that happened on September 11th, the Department of Homeland Security was created. Uh, we joined that department, and, and our mission set has been evolving, I think, ever since. I think we're still evolving to this day. Um, no longer is it just you know, the purebred kind of like search and rescue um, mission. We, we have a slew of other missions that we're continuing to, to, to kind of go down. Yeah, it's always been the case, isn't it? And every time you turn around, those missions change, uh, which, which builds for flexibility at the very least. So tell us uh, what you're doing for the Coast Guard right now here in Honolulu, Jim. Yeah, so currently I'm the operations officer at Air Station Barber Point. Um, we have four HC-130 aircraft, a uh, long-range search and rescue logistics platform. Uh, we also have four H-65 helicopters. It's our main search and rescue uh, asset that we deploy throughout the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, Air Station is about 250 people. We've got about 30-something uh, pilots here at the unit. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I tell you, though, I remember there was one helicopter went down a few years ago. I'm sure you were not here at the time, but uh, this is maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago. It went down in the ocean. It was on a training mission, as I remember, and everyone died. And they came from all over the country to celebrate uh, Barbara's Point and the air station and the pilots. It was, it was very touching. The commandant himself came and made a talk. And I'm sure that they, they think about that and talk about that in the sense that, you know, you never know when you're flying uh, an aircraft. You never know, especially a helicopter, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we still continue to do that memorial every year. Um, with the crew that perished on that on that helicopter, 
Uh, and then the cruise too over on, on the North shore of Molokai as well. This was years before that. Um, yeah, anytime, especially when you're op operating out here in the Pacific, especially on the C-130, not a lot of gas stops. So constantly kind of thinking through things and, and really putting yourself out there uh, when you operate throughout the Pacific. Yeah. Well, yeah, interesting. It takes me back. So, um, Nick, what do you do? What do you do for the 14th Coast Guard District? Yes, sir. I'm the chief of response at Sector Honolulu. So I oversee the three small boat stations throughout the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, so those are in Kauai, here in Oahu, and then in Maui. Uh, they all, all have a collection of the 45-foot response boat mediums and the 29-foot response boat smalls. Uh, in addition, I oversee the uh, fast response cutter, Coast Guard's newest cutter. It's 154 feet uh, that replaced the 110-foot uh, and the 87-foot cutters that were out here previously. And then I oversee uh, teams that respond to reports of oil spills and releases of hazardous materials, as well as uh, a team of enforcement folks who do anything from counter narcotics to um, more typical uh, law enforcement associated with the recreational boarding. <laughs> Yeah, we could talk to any one of you guys for half an hour for sure. <laughs> With all the things you do, the multiple missions and, and facilities and equipment, um, it, it, it's quite a it's quite a thing. Coast Guard has more missions than you know just the Navy, for example. Um, but you know, let me ask you. Um, you know, when I was in the service, they had ninety five footers and they had eighty two footers, and now they got footers that footers that are much less in size. Does does that is that because of the technology, the function, uh, or the mission? Why, why, why are they so small now? Uh, a little bit of both, sir. Uh, we're, we're constantly trying to refine what assets we have to best respond to the mission. So the 45s really replaced the 47s uh, and the 40 which you're probably familiar with. And then the 87s and 110s are still in the Coast Guard, but as they're developing these 154s, they are taking the spot in many times of those 110s and 87s, in particular out here in Hawaii, where we have a pretty heavy sea state, meaning it's nothing to see 10 to 15 footers, you know, for example, in the Ali Nui Haha Channel between Maui and Big Island. Uh, and, and the 87 and the 110s would just get so beat up by that, as well as endurance. Um, you know, if you had a SAR case on Big Island, and if you were really trying to get there in a hurry, you were going fast, you're burning a lot of fuel, you'd get there and would have maybe a day of searching, if that, where you had to refuel and go back to the SARC case, whereas these new 154s can go very quickly, get there and still have three or four days endurance on scene to get right into searching to try to save a life, and as well as much improved uh, technology as you do um, for better uh, capabilities. So a little bit of everything, but always in that pursuit of um, doing better to serve the public. What about the, the big ships? Are you are you working with the big ships? I remember what was the dimensions were 376, all right? 376, and they were brand new when I was in the service, but I think they're all retired now. What's the biggest ship you have here in, in San Island? So not, not quite all retired, I don't believe. We don't, um, there are a few stationed here, the new national security cutters, and uh, the guys can check me. I think it's 420 or 412, but they are the replacement for the 378s. And now we have two of those national security cutters home ported here. And a lot of the same thought process, better uh, technology, better equipment, uh, longer range, longer endurance, and obviously with it being brand new, um, not those problems of the aging uh, 378s. Yeah, and more expensive too, right? I'm, I'm sure they are. I don't have the exact dollar figure, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure they, uh, the, the country's getting their money's worth, I'm sure. Yeah, they're very, very capable assets. The big ships were actually, uh, the 37, was 378, I, I, miss, I missed it by two feet. Um, the 378s were in Vietnam. They were online in Vietnam. Uh, they, they were active uh, off the coast of Vietnam for several years. But uh, query, are they are they active now? Where do they go? Where where do these ships go? I mean, you have the biggest Coast Guard district in the world, um, millions and millions of square miles. Um, where do the big ships go? It's not inter island, is it? No, and I'll so, probably Jay, Jeff, if you don't mind, turn that question to you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so Jay, the U.S. Coast Guard 14 district is the largest district in the U.S. Coast Guard with 12 million square nautical miles. Um, 
It covers all of the Hawaiian Islands, the Central and Western Pacific. And, um, you know, we have Coast Guard units scattered uh, across Oahu, Maui, Kauai, the Big Island, American Samoa, Saipan, Guam, Singapore, and even Japan. But when we have these larger national security cutters, which are the flagship cutters of the Coast Guard, they are essentially the 378s of 2022. Um, we deploy them on an operation called Operation Blue Pacific. And Operation Blue Pacific is an operation that takes place throughout Oceania, and it's designed to build and strengthen our partnerships. And we leverage our unique Coast Guard authorities, our 11 statutory missions to address all the unique threats in this area of responsibility. Um, and these national security cutters will go down to, as far down to Tahiti. We currently have a Coast Guard cutter uh, in Fiji. The Coast Guard cutter Monroe is currently there. They have Fijian ship riders embarked on them. And they're currently conducting counter illegal fishing patrols within the Fijian waters, um, utilizing the Fijians authorities to, to conduct boardings on these vessels. Uh, to prevent illegal fishing. And then their plans after Fiji are to head to New Caledonia and conduct some engagements with the French Navy out there and until they end their patrol for us in Guam. So when we have these cutters available to us, they're super important. Um, what we like to do is, you know, wave the U.S. flag out in the Pacific, um, help our partners with their mission, strengthen our relations, and of course, one of our main missions in this area is uh, countering that legal, unreported, unregulated fishing threat that we see. Now, well, that's a kind of law enforcement. Uh, and aside from, you know, the more kinetic things like search and rescue, um, aids to navigation, um, I guess environmental protections, marine safety, the rest of the Coast Guard is all about law enforcement. Um, about the drugs, um, about the fishing, as you say. And uh, one thing I noticed, uh, this is after I got out, was that the Coast Guard, and you would be familiar with this, was because of its widespread, you know, contact through the, through the Pacific, it was involved, perhaps more than the, the other services, uh, in diplomatic relations, um, in, you know, being in contact with Coast Guards of other countries out there. Um, and, um, you know, connecting in sort of a diplomatic way with various agencies and organizations. So sort of like the uh, APCSS in Waikiki, the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, where there was a lot of contact between Coast Guard officers and diplomats or officers of other, um, other countries. Um, do you have contact like that? We sure do, sir. And uh, I can tell you that the Coast Guard's diplomatic presence throughout the Pacific is increasing. Uh, just uh, a year ago, we established a uh, Coast Guard attache in Canberra, Australia. And then we've also uh, have a new position that is opening up in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we have a Coast Guard attache there as well. We also have several security cooperation officers that are embedded into country teams in, uh, in countries across the Pacific, um, in particular in Fiji, and then also um, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam. So the Coast Guard definitely realizes that uh, there are a lot of partnerships here that we need to leverage in order to address the threats in the region. And so we're establishing, establishing these diplomatic uh, presences throughout the embassies here. Yeah, really important and, and well qualified. I think a Coast Guard officer would be, you know, better qualified than his peer in, in other services because of what the Coast Guard does, um, you know, and. Uh, and I'm sure that these attache jobs, these billets in various countries, are very attached. When I, when I was in the service, the big deal was the Admiralty and Shipping Section of the Department of Justice in San Francisco. Everybody would line up to get that job because um, that was so, hmm, what do you want to call it, avant-garde, um, because it was with the Department of Justice. But now it would seem to me that if you, if you, you study your wish list, wish card, what do they call it? Wish card, wish list? A dream sheet. Dream yeah. sheet, thank you. <laughs> You're going to want to consider putting in for um, uh, the, the attache, attache job in any one or a number of countries. That sounds like great experience and good for your career. Not as good as flying helicopters, I might add, but good. 
Am a I lot right? of the reason why the uh, the Coast Guard is uh, very relatable in the Pacific is because there's only three countries with established militaries. Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and Tonga are the only three countries within Oceania that have established militaries. So a lot of the, the military functions are carried out by their police forces, which are in the maritime environment are very similar to the Coast Guard. Uh, so that's how we re really relate to a lot of these countries out here with similar mission sets. Yeah, valuable and uh, mind expanding. You know, you spend a career. All you, all you guys are going to be career. Uh, Jim, you've been in now about 35 years, was it? <laughs> <laughs> What's it uh, like to have a career in the Coast Guard these days? Uh, it's, been a, it's been an interesting journey, sir. It's, uh, I've enjoyed it. Uh, being able to fly uh, for over, shoot, for over 12 years now, 13 years, I think I'm going on. I'm at 20 right now, but being able to fly C-130s uh, when I was stationed in Clearwater throughout the Caribbean, uh, when I was stationed up in Kodiak throughout all of Alaska, the border with Russia, um, and then this is my second tour down in Barbers Point. So flying throughout the Pacific and doing missions with the Coast Guard throughout the Pacific has been amazing. Um, I did have a, an interesting time, too. I had a two-year special assignment in D.C., working as the liaison to the, to the Senate for the Coast Guard. Um, so, yeah, it's just been a, a great journey. Get to see and do some amazing things, go to places that you would never even dream of. You wouldn't it's be interested in an attache job, would you? I I thought about it when I left here the first time. I did. I did. <laughs> you was, you was, have to uh, talk to Jeff about it, yeah. <laughs> the stars did not align for me at that point. You know, I read yesterday that um, that the Alaska Airlines uh, had uh, suspended its flights from Hawaii to Alaska because of a shortage of pilots. Uh, and any pilot in the service is potentially a pilot in you know, the civilian world um, later on. So you must follow that. What, what is going on with the industry, the occupation of pilots these days, and, and the connection of that, whatever it is, with uh, pilots in the service? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, and that's a challenge that I think the Coast Guard has and the entire DOD has right now, especially for their, their fixed-wing flyers. The, the airlines are hurting for pilots. And we have a marketable skill. So we're, we're seeing a lot of junior members that once their commitment is up, are leaving the service to go that route. Um, coupled with the recent change in the retirement system, uh, no longer having a legacy retirement system that you get to 20 years, we've now gone to a blended retirement system. So folks can walk after their commitment is up with that skill set and be hired by a, a major airline you know, within, within a few months. And still have a retirement. Well, not a retirement per se. They'll have they can walk away with essentially a four hundred one k. But the money that they put in, it doesn't disappear. They can walk away with that. Wow, that's that's a major change from my time. You know, huge change, and it's a big challenge that we're seeing. And and as we kind of see this kind of evolve, we're still in the throes of it right now, but. As we try to recruit and retain uh, pilots, that's that's a big big challenge. We haven't figured it out yet. Yeah, well, maybe you need some help from Congress. <laughs> we send we need a lot of help from we need a lot of help from Congress. We all need a lot of help from Congress these days. Uh, so, Nick, you know, well, one one thing um, is is this this case uh, in San Diego, the Kimball, I think it was Kimball. Am I right? Um, must be one of the big ships out of San Diego Coast Guard Station. Um, you know, uh, somehow they got their hands on, what, thousands of pounds of drugs and had this big, huge bust um, involving millions and millions of dollars. That was quite something. Um, what is it like these days? I mean, Coast Guard had been involved in drugs, uh, well, since my time, uh, although that was kind of brand new at that time. But how much, how much time do you spend? How much time, how much investment is the Coast Guard making in, in getting drug runners? Yeah, that, that's a good question, sir. So I actually started my career, my second tour about 16, 18 years ago, and I was in California, and I actually was... Uh, How come you office. look so much younger than Jim? <laughs> We're, We're class classmates. Wow, wait a minute. saying that. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, so I was a law enforcement duty officer, and essentially we would uh, manage the counter-narcotics for the Eastern Pacific, and we would work in, in, you know, coordination with multiple other folks. And I, so we've been involved in this mission for quite some time, as, as you've said. 
and for the foreseeable future. But uh, of note, I would just say the the, uh, the methods in which um, things are transported has changed over time, and we've uh, tried very hard to keep up with those changes and then respond accordingly. But as, as Jeff mentioned too, uh, most recently the, the, the Commandant has, and those above him too, have mentioned that even more than counter narcotics now, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing is a national strategic priority uh, in line with, if not greater than, the threat from counter narcotics. So uh, we really uh, are shifting our focus uh, here at Oceania quite a bit. One, because that has been moving out here, um, for the counter narcotics, but two mainly just because that the importance that everyone sees on that issue of, of uh, IUU fishing. Yeah, well, I have, I have a couple of questions about that. One is on the drugs. Um, you know, drugs are changing. There are drugs now, you know, that did not exist uh, in my time um, and that are dangerous and also expensive. Um, there are also drugs that could be, and I I wouldn't predict uh, it'll be in the near term, but that could become legal, like pot, uh, in the next few years. Maybe Congress will decide to let that go. Um, so the mission changes, the drugs change, and therefore the people change, the whole industry changes. Uh, is, it more, uh, is, it, is it more or less easy for you now um, to catch these guys? Um, and is there uh, the kind of prosecutions you want to see having gone to that trouble? So I will throw out the asterisk there that um, the folks doing the majority of those counter narcotics are um, in the West Coast over in California and maybe could give you a more uh, concrete answer. But just from my perspective, I would say, you know, we have worked very hard in the Coast Guard to continue uh, to adapt as the Coast Guard always has. We've always adapted. And if there are new threats, new hazards, we respond to those accordingly. And I think we are, as you as you mentioned, with that big seizure down in San Diego. I think the evidence is clear. We are being very successful. Uh, we will continue to adapt as as the threats adapt, whether that's counter narcotics, whether that's illegal fisheries, uh, or what have you. That's that's really one of the joys of being in the Coast Guard. The mission and the people. They're both phenomenal. And it it is that uh, just inherent in who we are as Coasties to always adapt and figure out a way to, to get it done. Well, when you're uh, coming up alongside and telling them that you're about to board them because you think they got some drugs on board, you get a little resistance on that. Um, do you feel uh, there's a certain danger in doing that? Um, do they respond with um, running away or violence? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think there's always inherent danger in the things we do, whether it's search and rescue, whether it's just flying a helicopter, operating a small boat. Uh, that's definitely part of the job that you you do take on that risk. I think the Coast Guard does an exceptional job in identifying risk and then uh, mitigating that risk through a series of factors. Uh, and that really is just the quality of our people that that help do that. Um, and, and you know, so when we do come alongside a vessel suspected of uh, trafficking narcotics, um, our folks are trained appropriately. Um, but many times, you know, we do have folks that are compliant. Um, but then in the instances they are not, we have uh, methods in place um, to go ahead and, and, and combat those levels of noncompliance uh, to get the end state we want to. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of that discussion. <laughs> you know, the coast right. is here, you know, better watch out. So um, now fishing, fishing is a whole new thing. It seems to me that from what you've said, fishing is, uh, is a matter of public policy more important than it was a few years ago. Uh, and the United States is not going to allow um, violations of fishing laws and treaties and, you know, agreements uh, uh, as much, perhaps, as, as took place in the past. Why is there a change in policy? Is fishing more important on a global scale, on a national scale? Or are you finding more of it? Are you finding more of it by, by countries that perhaps uh, are, are mm, doing it as, as an offensive maneuver? So, Jay, um, what I can say is that um, what has been reported is 93% of the world's major fish stocks are classified as fully exploited, overexploited, or significantly depleted. It is definitely a major issue. And um, illegal fishing, just by its nature, it's, uh, it's difficult to quantify, but some estimates place the global impacts of illegal fishing in the tens of billions of dollars of lost revenue per year. So, just by the nature of legal fishing, you're taking away 
um, you know, the economic prosperity of countries and also uh, food security, because a lot of countries, especially here in this region, whether, you know, um, they're coastal states, uh, coastal nations, uh, they depend on fish for their food security. And if you have fishermen going in there and illegally poaching their fish, uh, that creates tons of problems. Again, not only economic problems for the country, but uh, food scarcity. So that's why it's definitely living, uh, risen to the level that it has uh, with regards to our priorities in the Coast Guard. Well, it's the same thing with environmental protections, isn't it? Yes, and um, you know we have 11 statutory missions. Um, environmental protection is certainly one of those missions um, that's super important. Um, and that, that that's all tied together because you definitely need to protect the uh, maritime environment to assure that the fish are able to be sustained and survive. So it's definitely all tied together. Yeah, well, connected for sure. So, you know, one thing, Jim, is that we have seen uh, through the Navy, um, you know, um, a, um, a challenge to American forces in, in the West Pacific. Uh, we've seen the Chinese build islands and arm them. Uh, we've seen them uh, challenge and stop ships and aircraft who come into waters and areas they claim they have legal control over, but which they don't. Um, is the Coast Guard involved in any of that? Because this is a great challenge in Western Pacific, and I'm sure that uh, PACOM is very interested in maintaining a presence. Are you part of that presence? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, we are. And, and, and... Both, uh, I kind of want to touch back too on the on the drug mission as well. We Coast Guard C-130s based out of Barbers Point will deploy to South America and participate in those counter narcotic missions as well. So we'll we'll, we'll incorporate in those missions and then out in the Pacific uh, in conjunction with that with what Jeff was saying with the the fishery engagements and the fishery enforcement. So the C-130s uh, will provide that maritime patrol aircraft and 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 link up with that national security cutter with our sector Guam out there and with the district and with the host nations to provide that maritime intelligence and that picture of where both are. But yeah, providing that presence, seeing that big four fans of freedom aircraft flying around with the, with the racing stripe uh, means something. Uh, and we're in exciting times too. So the Barber's Point, we're, all, we're 95% through with our uh, transition. So we're getting rid of our aging H model, and we have our new C-130J model, which is going to be a game changer out here. It comes packaged with a Minotaur sensor system, which incorporates, able to feed into that national security cutter, is a way bigger picture uh, for maritime intelligence. So we're really excited to see that come online here in the next few months. How do you, uh, how do you get these helicopters to distant locations? Uh, you put them on the, on the fantail of a ship and strap them down and Take them everywhere. Is that what happens? Yep, that's exactly it. So the national security counter will come into uh, in the port here in Honolulu, and uh, we'll embark that that 65 uh, on the back of the boat with the team, and they'll they'll deploy with that uh, with that cutter, and they'll be with that cutter until she pulls back into uh, in the in the Hawaii again in you know a few weeks or however long it takes. But yeah, they're they're with them and they're part of the crew and they're doing the missions whatever they uh, whatever they need. Exciting. Exciting. God, you guys have so many missions. Um, so let me ask you, uh, Nick, about um, uh, safety and um, life saving. Um, and, and, and in connection with that, I want to ask about an issue that comes up all the time in these shows is in case, just in case, Hawaii is subject to extreme weather, uh, some kind of weather, you know, disaster, calamity, what have you. Um, and we have trouble. Uh, one thing or another, we have trouble. And we need somebody uh, strong and flexible to help us out, help the state out. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, if you ask the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, they'll say, sure. Um, but, you know, the Coast Guard is closer to the people, in my opinion. The Coast Guard knows more people, deals with more, you know, local institutions, regular engagement. <coughs> With local institutions. So is the Coast Guard there to help in, in case of a, of a disaster that affects the state? We are, yes, sir. And it's one of those things where it's a blessing and a curse uh, living out here that that tyranny of distance we talk about being so far from mainland. 
from the continental United States. So if we do need help, it, it is the reality is it's a ways before it's gonna gonna get here. So um, you know that's the curse, but the blessing is, and the Coast Guard feels so good at it is is leveraging those partnerships. You know between federal, state, and local um, agencies, we do such a good job of working together. Uh, in a unified effort, in particular during plans and exercises, we get to know each other. We we, we run these drills and exercises so that in a real world event, uh, we can respond more effectively and more uh, efficiently just to protect both the um, you know the the folks who live here and the, and the folks who come to visit here. And that's everything from search and rescue to hurricane uh, response, sir. Very important, you know, because if people walk around. Ask anybody on the street, and they'll say, "Well, the military is here to help, and they will help." So, but I think the Coast Guard is special in that regard. Um, so, you know, I want to I want to ask you a, a legal question. I have many legal questions for you, Jeff. <laughs> we could be here too long. Um, my my question is, you know, in the old days, the Coast Guard was part of the Treasury Department, but in time of war, it became part of the. Mm, the War Department, the Defense Department, the Navy, so to speak. Does that still work the same way? Um, and what, what triggers that? Will you, will you move over uh, from Homeland Security, if at all, uh, to, the, to the Department of Defense? So, yeah, Jay, I think that uh, law is still in place to actually um, be able to ship the Coast Guard to uh, the Department of Defense um, when in need. But, um, I can tell you that the U.S. Coast Guard actively supports the Department of Defense globally. Uh, my previous tour was in Manama, Bahrain, where I served as the U.S. Coast Guard liaison to the U.S. Navy's Fifth Fleet that operated out in uh, out the uh, Southwest uh, uh, Southwest Asia, and we have six U.S. Coast Guard uh, fast response cutters uh, that are there operating out of Bahrain as we speak. Uh, as well as a whole contingent of Coasties. Uh, and here in uh, Hawaii, we have a very good relationship with our DOD partners. And, um, you know, they, they are um, constantly working with us on innovative ways to collaborate and spread the U.S. presence across the Pacific. We actually embark U.S. Coast Guard law enforcement uh, boarding teams on board Navy vessels, conduct fishery boardings throughout the Pacific. It's called the Oceania Maritime Security Initiative, and has been very successful in um, encountering illegal fishing throughout the Pacific. Well, you know, we're not at war in Ukraine just yet, but uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Austin is watching it like a hawk. Uh, I shouldn't use the term hawk. That may not be the best term to use in this context. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are various, um, you know, branches of the service who are interested in what's going on, who are planning and who are designing systems that would help them. Uh, query, is the Coast Guard involved in that? Are you anywhere near there in the Black Sea or ever would be, uh, you know, an appropriate advantage? Um, could, could you be involved? Absolutely. I think the Coast Guard is a very nimble service. Uh, we have very unique capabilities that the Department of Defense can leverage to help out um, with that mission if they if they choose to do so. Um, and even diplomatically, I, we do have a U.S. Coast Guard uh, position um, assigned to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. Uh, so even from the diplomatic standpoint, we can assist in that way. But uh, as you said, we have very we have very unique capabilities in the Coast Guard and we could be leveraged in a variety of different ways. And that's certainly one area uh, where we could assist DOD if the, uh, if the ask is there. Wow. Okay. Well, you never know what's going to happen these days. It moves so fast. You know, Jim, when I was in the service, they always asked me the difference between a Coast Guard and the Navy. And I would say, we save lives. <laughs> <laughs> is that still true? That is true. But I, I have to give, I have to tip my hat to our Navy brethren. Um, we do, when, at times of need, when, when our planes are, are broken or we're out of, out of air crews, uh, the local uh, squadrons will will pick up the the slack and they'll they'll stand the ready for us every now and again. So they have saved lives here. <laughs> yeah, well, that was certainly the case in the sinking of the Hemi Maru by the SS uh, Greenville, a, a nuclear attack submarine out of Pearl. 
um, where the uh, the submarine that, that cut the uh, Ahimea Maru in half uh, off Waikiki didn't really know how to rescue the people. And they had to call the Coast Guard out to rescue the people. And the Coast Guard saved a lot of lives that day. It's very interesting. You guys are expert in that. So you do save lives. Well, Jim, I want to offer you the, uh, the, the last moment uh, to, to give a takeaway uh, to our listening audience and viewers. And if you could shape your takeaway around why they should join, support, learn about the Coast Guard, um, and maybe even enlist, you know? Um, yeah. Could you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Coast Guard is a very unique service. It's a dynamic service. We're all over, obviously, all the over. coastlines, anywhere attached to water. But like Jeff was saying, you can find yourself as an attache over in Moscow. I mean, we are literally embedded everywhere. And the unique authorities that are granted to us uh, as Coasties allow us to do a lot of unique missions. I think it's a fantastic service. We're in a position now where we're getting a lot of brand new toys. I mentioned some of them earlier. We got the NSCs, OPCs. So if you're coming into the service at this point, you're most likely going to be on a, a brand new ship or aircraft, which is exciting. Um, the integration with technology and the, and the forefront of cyber, uh, that whole new position that's coming online, I, I think it's just a, a really unique time to come into the service. And then for those that want to learn about it, we haven't even touched on our AUX auxiliary program um, for civilians that would like to be a part of the Coast Guard. I think that's a, a unique mission set that we have as well. Um, so, yeah, now's, now's the time. That's great. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate you guys coming on. And I'd like to leave you with one thought. You know, uh, Jeff, that thing about, uh, you know, applying on your, uh, what, dream sheet um, for uh, a, <laughs> a uh, you know, a job, an attache job. Uh, I could probably do that, but I would want to skip the attache job in Moscow. Would that be all right? Uh, I think that will be fine. And, uh, yeah, I, I could totally see why. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate you guys coming on. Aloha. Tempa piranhas. Oh. <laughs>